We'll make a start, folks, tonight with number 500. If you have your hymn books, page 377. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abideth ever through eternal years the same. Number 500. We'll stand as we sing it. singing. Let's just unite our hearts together. Word of prayer just before I come out, I learned that our sister Mary Hannah lost her brother, uh, Robert James Hannett from Dundrum area. And so you might remember Mary at this particular time. Let's unite our hearts together, please. Let's all uh, seek the Lord. Father in heaven, we do come again into thy presence in the Savior's precious name. We thank the Lord for another opportunity midweek even to meet in thy house. And thou hast called at the house of prayer for all nations. And we praise thee, Lord, we're on praying ground tonight. And we come to thee in the Saviour's name, that name that is above every name, the one who is seated at thy right hand, who lives in the power of an endless life. And, O oh God, we uh, take comfort tonight to know there's one in the glory who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities and who ever lives to make intercession for his people. And Lord, we pray that uh, thou would come and remember us for good tonight. Bless our time, even around thy word. Bless our time and prayer. Oh, we ask, we covet, Lord, 
the outpouring of thy Holy Spirit, not only to be our teacher tonight, uh, but to help us even in the place of prayer. And we do, Lord, be mindful of those who need a special uh, touch tonight from the Master. And we pray that thou would draw near even to Mary, bind up a, a heart that has been uh, thrust into mourning. We pray for that family circle, that, Lord, that thou would meet them at the point of their need. And, O oh God, that they, uh, Lord, might prove the, the God of all comfort. We pray, O oh God, that thou would even minister again to uh, hearts, Lord, that, O oh God, are thrust into sorrow. And, Lord, especially if there are those that are without Christ. And we pray that they uh, might be even, uh, the Lord, softened of heart at this time. And they might be pointed uh, to the altogether lovely one. We ask, O oh God, that thou would remember again the uh, Spears family and the cousin's household. We pray, O oh God, for the Hawk family as well. And we thank thee for grace given. We pray, Lord, that thou would continue even to uh, bind up those hearts. And, Lord, that thou would speak even with that still small voice at this time. Thank the Lord for answering the prayer for we Alpha. And we pray, O oh God, you'd continue to bless the lad and thou would strengthen him in these days. And, O oh, Father, that thou would keep thy hand upon him. And, Lord, thou would give a peace even to a mother and father and others who look after him. And so, Lord, do accept of our thanks for even a good report there. And we ask, O oh God, that thou would accept of our thanks for Brother George. We thank the Lord for bringing him home again. And, Lord, for the good spirit that he's in. And we pray, Lord, that thou would bless him from day to day. Uh, Lord, we pray particularly for Eleanor. And Lord, the new uh, responsibilities and adjustments in the home. And we pray that thou would be with her tonight. Encourage her. Give her, Lord, that needed rest in the evening time. And Lord, we pray that thou would uh, draw near to thy child and the family circle undertake for them, we pray. And so, Lord, there, these are but a few. And there's others who need thee. And, Lord, need thy touch. Remember Velma tonight. Raise her up again to health and strength. Linda as well and, and Charlotte. O oh God, we pray that thou would encourage them, bless them to know that they're in the hands of the great physician. And, Lord, uh, thou hast brought them thus far. And we pray that thou would bring them right through. And so, Father, uh, do answer prayer. Remember Brother George and Cargney. Remember Ray as well. Barbara, Lord, remember them for good. Thank thee, Lord, for even the, the, their encouragements uh, to us. And we thank the Lord for uh, thy hand upon them. And we pray that thou would continue uh, to bless in these days. Remember our land, Lord. Oh, God, we, 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 we see, Lord, a, a corruption even within the judicial system. What has come out tonight, and Lord, how it... Uh, it turns us, how it, Lord, repels us from, from, from all that's going on. But, O oh God, we take confidence tonight. Thou knowest the hidden things of darkness. Thou knowest, Lord, what's going on behind the scenes. Nothing is hidden from Thee. And we pray, Lord, that Thou would bring evil doers even down. And we ask, O oh God, you'd spoil their plans. And, Lord, their imaginations and, and all their planning. O oh God, we pray that thou would come, Lord, and thou would raise a standard again. And there might be, Lord, even a move of thy spirit in these days in our land. And, Lord, the, the old sinners will be removed. And, Lord, the, all the rest of them as well. Father, we pray that thou would, Lord, uh, come to her. Don't leave us to herself. Don't leave us, Lord, or give us over as a prey unto her enemy. But, Lord, step in. And we pray, Lord, for the uh, going forth of the gospel in all its fullness. We know it's the only answer. And God is the only answer for a nation. And we pray, Lord, that men and women might look away even to the Lord tonight. So, Father, hear our prayer as we turn to thy word. Give us help. Fill us with thy spirit and with power. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 14. Please, and I want to begin at the words of verse 13, just reading to the end of the chapter. Genesis chapter 14, I've entitled the message tonight, Which King? Which King? 
Genesis 14. And you'll see at the start of the chapter, it's, uh, there's a list of kings, and then there's another list of kings. So it's four against five in the confederacy. And verse 13 says, And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol and brother of Anair. And these were confederate with, with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods, and the woman also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedalamire, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's deal. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and I will not take anything that is thine, lest I should say I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Anair, Eschol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. Amen. Just ending uh, at the end of the chapter, uh, knowing the Lord will add his own uh, blessing upon it. When we read these uh, verses, men and women, we come across uh, <clears throat> two names which are very similar. And maybe if you read too quickly, you think it's all about the same man, but it's not. There is the king, uh, there's two names, sorry, uh, of Sodom and Salem. And Salem is an old name, uh, most commentators believe, for Jerusalem. But of course, there's a world of difference between them. The holy city and the city of Sodom, uh, nigh the coast of the Dead Sea. That can be noted in the meanings. Uh, Salem means peace. That, of course, is one of God's gifts uh, to his people. He has given us a peace. In the knowledge of sins forgiven, he has given us a peace uh, that passes all understanding. And, of course, he gave Christ to be our Savior uh, that purchased our peace through the blood of his cross. The king of Salem was a man by the name of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is a picture of Christ. We'll not have time to delve into that, but you can do a little study on that if you like. He's a high priest. He's also a king. And there's two uh, offices already of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we learn more about Melchizedek even from the book of Hebrews. Now, on the other hand, you have Sodom. And Sodom... Uh, has the, the, the thought of burning. In the dictionary, it merely stands for the practice that went on within those cities. And so it is an aim associated with depravity, with wickedness, with sin, and all the rest. And it was the representatives of these two places that came out to meet Abraham after his conquering of the eastern kings. The first who attempted to meet him was the king of Sodom. The first who really met him was the king of Salem. And he came in God's name and he blessed him. And what we see in these verses is how Abram is irresistibly drawn to one and he shuns the other. It brings before us what the allegiance of the Christian should be and where it should not be. And therefore I've entitled it, Which King? Which King? I want you to see, first of all here, the desire of the world. We don't need to labor the point. But Sodom stands for the world and how the world operates, what it stands for. 
And it is interesting to see where its interests lie when we consider this king and his desires. After the battle, Abram, by right of the victory achieved, had the right to the spoils. Bera, the king of Sodom, had lost his possessions to the four confederate kings. They, in turn, had lost all their possessions and the people to Abram and his small army of trained servants. But now the king of Sodom wants his own things back. He emerges from the slime pits where he had fallen and he desires to recover as much of the spoils of battle. He's willing to compromise. Even to get as much as he could back uh, to himself. You'll notice the words of verse 21. And it says, The king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. There's the compromise. Give me the people, I'm sure you can keep the the, the spoils. To any lesser individual, that would have been a great temptation. For it was giving Abram the chance to be wealthy, to be rich, for he would keep the goods as well. It would give him the uh, exaltation, it would give him the praise of being a, a generous warrior who returned the people. Great temptation. That's the spirit of the world. It, doesn't, it does not want wealth at the expense of reputation. It wants both. But if it can't have both, then it will usually desire the wealth without the reputation if it has to. And the king of Sodom thought this way. But where he was mistaken was he thought Abraham was of the same mind. But he wasn't. Indeed, not only did Abram think differently, he regarded the offer of the king of Salem as an attempt to gain for himself some of the glory of Abram's success, which would mean, of course, that that glory was taken away from from God and it would be given to a worldly man. Abram saw it as a temptation. Because he knew that if he kept some of the spoils of Sodom and the other cities, then he would never again be able to say that his sole dependence, his sole source of blessing was in the Lord God. The king of Sodom would be able to go out and round about. You know why that man's rich? It's because I I give him the possessions. It should be understood that Abraham stands out as a man who prospered only because of God's blessing. God enriched him. Up to this time, Abram had never sought the wealth. He never had resorted to questionable methods of getting his wealth. He never had anyone who contributed to his wealth. And so the offer of this king of Sodom would have destroyed that testimony and his spiritual standing. And so that's why he rejects it. If God is possessor of heaven and earth, and that's what we have read in the words of verse uh, 19, and he is the God of heaven and earth, he is the possessor of heaven and earth. If that is so, then Abraham understood that he was able to take care of his servants without benefiting from the accumulated possessions of a worldly, of a pagan, of a corrupt king. Abraham was therefore determined to take nothing, even though it was all his by right. Because he's guarding his testimony. And men and women, there needs to be a lot of that emphasized to God's people today, how we obtain our wealth, how we have those possessions. We need to be on our guard. As we proverb, and I'll just read it to you, Proverbs 16 and verse 8, and 
Proverbs are very pithy, they're short, and, but they get to the point. It says this, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Not good. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. If the world can claim part of the success in a believer's life, then our witness is blunted, our testimony will be ignored, they will be seen to be just like every one of the rest of them. No difference. If, however, all glory is given to God as Abram determined it would be, then God is truly honored. A good witness still stands. So be on your guard for the desire of the world. Let me show you here also the desire of Abram. Because above everything else, it should be noted that Abraham desired the glory of God. That's above his wealth. That's above his possessions. That's above his uh, acclaim in the community of one who conquered the Confederacy. Above everything. And that meant that he was not leaning towards any allegiance with the king of Sodom. The reality was, as it is with the world, that those, <coughs> the king of Sodom and those around him, they had no concern for God. They had no concern for his glory. The world is the same to this night. The world is at enmity with God and always shall be. Here's a king that had heard Remember what I said, he made the first attempt to meet Abram in verse 17, but it's actually the king of Salem that has the meeting, verse 18. And then we, we deal with the king of Sodom and his offer later on. So here he's in the company of the high priest of the Most High God. He hears Melchizedek and what he has to say, yet it gives no, it has no impression upon him. All the time, his mind is not on the words that glorified God who was the possessor of heaven and earth, but all the time, his mind is on the spoils and he's wondering, how much am I going to get of these back? Wealth and reputation are two aspects that are the most important to the world. But you see, Abraham had something else. Abraham had God. His desire was for God's honor above all. And so it should be with the child of God. You know our shorter catechism? What is man's chief end? It is but to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That was Abram's great desire. For he knew to take the spoils of Sodom would detract from God's honor, and so he wanted none of them. I want to illustrate the same truth by another man. That other man is Ezra. You turn over to the book of Ezra, and as you do so, I'll just give you a little uh, background. Ezra, of course, was a scribe, and he was a man that uh, was given the responsibility of leading a great company of God's people out of the captivity of Babylon and back to their beloved land. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah really need to come together. One is the rebuilding of the temple. The other is the rebuilding of the walls. But that journey home from Babylon to Jerusalem, quite a journey, was also a treacherous journey. It was a particularly dangerous terrain. And the keen heart of Xerxes might have expected to have to provide the soldiers to protect the people. After all, it was under his command, it was under his decree that they were allowed and permitted to leave. So it would be incumbent upon him to provide the security along the way. But Ezra, you see, spoke about the power of God. If you look at Ezra chapter 8, in the words of verse 21, he says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for our substance. For I was ashamed 
to require the king, a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So Ezra had a right to have those soldiers come for the security along the way. Abram had a right to the spoils, but both men relinquished them because of their concern for the honor of God. Ezra had already said to the king, the hand of our God is upon us. We'll not need your men. We'll not need the soldiers. God's hand is upon us. And we have sought him. And he will keep us in the way. And so there is another example. You see, men and women, it's easier to say my, my chief end is to glorify God than it is to put it into reality. We can recite that shorter catechism, but it's putting it into practice is the main thing. What the world needs to see from the church are the people of God putting this truth into action. Have you ever, and I throw this out as a question to you, have you ever given up something? Have you ever refused something because of the glory of God? You see, we can worship God sincerely. We can uh, do it in a reverent manner as I Trust we always do. In our praise, in our praying, reading of the Scriptures. But the world needs to see our great God and how we trust Him. That's what I mean by putting it into practice. We believe that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. But do we actually trust Him to protect our homes, our neighbors, ourselves, as we go in and out? We believe that God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. And He's all-wise. But do we trust His wisdom as it is revealed to us in the Scriptures rather than trusting or leaning on our own understanding, especially when those two things are different? My ways are not thy ways sometimes. We profess that God is a spirit. And spiritual things will endure and they'll last, while natural things, material things, they'll all pass away. But do we really put spiritual concerns and matters before material ones? Is our walk with God and the spiritual state of our soul really, really more important than our bank account or our reputation or whatever else you want to put in there. That's what I mean by putting that truth into practice. You see, these things are glorifying to God in practice. And for the man or woman, young person who does those things, I'll tell you something. As the rest of the catechism says, you will enjoy him forever and then. And that was Abram's desire. The honor of God. As a final wee note there, I want you to see that is the debt to God. Abram didn't compromise over his answer to the king of Sodom. You look again at the verse 22, because this is when he speaks with him now. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. There's a second time that's mentioned that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say I have made Abraham rich. That was his position. Now, he didn't enforce that position upon the men that came with him. They were entitled to what they had eaten, etc. That's what you have in verse 24. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which were with me. But as for Abram, he's not compromising. He wasn't going to take anything from the king of Sodom. Not even the smallest of items. Not even a thread of a garment. Not even a, a, what we would say is a shoelace. 
He's absolutely sure in it. You see, he's committed unto the Lord. And that is evidenced as we see the parallel that is drawn between his treatment of the king of Sodom to his treatment to the king of Salem. As defiant he is against the king of Sodom, he is equally as submissive unto Melchizedek. In other words, while Abram acknowledged no debt to the kings of the plain, he does acknowledge his debt to God through God's priest, which he showed by giving Melchizedek the first portion. You look at verse 20, and it says there, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. There's the words of Melchizedek. And then it says, And he, as Abram, gave him tithes of all the high priest of the, of the Most High. And it was in this decision that we can see how Abram's relationship grew strong. He drew close to God before he drew away from Sodom. Since he knew God's blessing, he didn't need whatever the world would supposedly give him. Neither do we. We have Christ, we have God, we have everything. Isn't it interesting that Melchizedek met him with bread and wine? You think about that, verse 18. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Abram partakes of that, maybe even his men as well. Nothing more of said of those elements in the Old Testament. But we cannot pass over them because of the significance of them within the New Testament. They're the very things that symbolize the most intimate communion with God. They're the emblems that's found on the Lord's table. Bread is the symbol of life. And God is the source of life. Wine is the symbol of joy. God is also the source of our joy. It's Christ who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said also those words in uh, John chapter 17, in the words of verse 13, uh, and somebody says this, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. He's both our life and he's our joy. And of course, the bread and the wine are the elements that are found in the communion feast, which the Lord has left with His church to remember Him. Where does life and joy come from? They're given by the one who is both the king of righteousness as well as the king of peace. And you'll know from Hebrews that that's uh, signified in the name Melchizedek. He's the king of righteousness and the king of peace, as Christ. The Savior came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And he spoke to us that our joy might be full. John 15, verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. The Lord wants us to be a joyful people. And he's given us that life, that eternal life that abundant life which the world cannot take away. Drawing upon the life and the joy of the Lord and that close communion with him. You see, that was Abram's secret weapon. And it can be ours as well. As long as we are far from God, men and women, then the world will present its temptation. And we'll be overcome by them. No doubt about that. Because we have in the power and strength of our, of our own selves to overcome those temptations. We need that from the Lord. But if we are filled by God, at the end of the battles of another day, and we have that bread and wine, if you like, then we will want nothing more. We'll be ready to go again. 
will be ready to return to the battlefield the next day. Because our dependence is on the Lord. And He is our life and He is our joy. He's everything we need. With this I close. The question was put to John Knox one day if he was afraid to face the Queen of Scotland. You can appreciate the times that he lived in. You know what his reply was? He said, how can I fear a mere earthly monarch when I've just been, I've just spent four hours with God? That challenges us. Some of God's people maybe wouldn't spend four minutes, 40 minutes, even a day with the Lord. John Knox said, I've just spent four hours with God. Why should I fear any earthly monarch? I pray that our lives would have that closeness. And like Abram, we would not be intimidated by any worldly adversary but would seek that the Lord might have all the honor. Which king? Don't try and serve both kings. The king of this world, the king of the old flesh, and Christ the king. Cannot serve God and mammon. Let's serve the Lord. Pray the Lord will bless his word even to our heart tonight. Uh, for his own